الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى that he makes us of the people who work for the akhirah and that he makes us understand the true reality of the life of this dunya and that he doesn't make of those people who have been deceived and tricked Likewise, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows us to get closer to him and that he accepts everything that we put forth and that he multiplies for us our rewards because we seek his akhirah but our deeds do not meet the requirements that are necessary for a person to have a, left, a lofty status. So we ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pardon and we ask for his mercy and we ask for his generosity. This is the final session where we are looking at the wasiyah of Ibn Qudam al Muwafiq al Deen, Rahimahullah. And if you've been following, then you will realize that this book is talking about zuhud, leaving anything which will not benefit a person in the akhir. In the very first chapter, he says, hasten to do good deeds because it's the reason why you exist. In the second chapter, he gave us an example of a people that have been stuck on a on an island, there's no way off the island and then people's prerogatives change some people live to live on that island and some people recognize that they are stuck on this island they don't belong on that island and they, their stay is temporary so let's work towards something which is better elsewhere then he talked about rahimahullah preserving your deeds because those people who work for the Akhirah don't want to come Yawm al Qiyamah with their deeds becoming corrupted. Returning back to Allah, thinking that you've got something, but in actual fact you don't. That is the worst thing that could ever happen to a human being. And then in last lessons chapter, we looked at how he is giving us advice in, in order for us to preserve our connection to the Akhirah. And he said that there were two very important things. Number one, he called it al muraqaba and number two, he called it Khashya. Muraqaba means that you have a level of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this could be from anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created all of us for a connection with Him. And it is not like how some deviant sects believe that there are only a certain group of pious people who have a connection with not everyone has the ability to have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you not seen that hadith? There are so many hadith. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said a person was walking. He removed something which was harmful on the path and he attained Allah's jannah. He attained the objective. Another person forgives another person's debt. Normal people, like me and you. And he forgave him his debt and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this person was generous and I'm going to be generous to him. Jannah. A prostitute gives a dog water. What happens to her? Jannah. Therefore, we cannot understand from what we are seeing here that this book or this advice is for an elite that doesn't exist amongst us. No, that's not the case. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created every single one of us for a purpose. And it's the same purpose. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ the only reason why you exist is that you can have a level of connection with Allah of obedience. And that is worship, but also ta'ah, as in acts of obedience to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala outside of those things that we traditionally recognize as acts of worship. Based on that now, the last piece of advice, and this is, like I said, the final session, he completes his book by talking about something which is known as Fada'il Al-A'mal. Now, this chapter title, Fada'il Al-A'mal, I'm sure is uh, known to every single one of us. In actual fact, there are books which are entitled Fada'il Al-A'mal. But unfortunately, some of them are riddled with deviancy and shirk and innovation. But the precedence is found from the time of the Salaf. Muwafiq al-Din himself has a chapter here for Dalai Ahmad. Before him, Ibn Abi Dunya, a scholar of hadith, had a book called for Dalai Ahmad. 
دي الدين مقدسي has a book called Fadail Amal. Riyadh al-Salihin is a book which is about Fadail Amal. In actual fact, the Kutub al-Sitta, Bukhari, Muslim, until the end, every single one of those books of Hadith have chapters in it which they are talking about Fadail Amal. What does it mean, Fadail Amal? The author is basically saying here, once you recognize that your existence is in the Akhirah, Fadail meaning virtuous, Amal, deeds. Hasten. Create a portion in the day for yourself. Create a mindset inside of yourself that you're going to do extra for da'il a'mal. This is on top of the things which are wajib already. This is on top of the things that you need to stay away from which are haram already. He is completing his advice to encourage the reader and the listener not only just to preserve your deeds, not only to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to correct the mindset as to why you exist. But then when you recognize all of that, hasten. Use every single opportunity you have to do good deeds. He says, Wa'lam, rahimakullah. Have firm knowledge, may Allah have mercy on you. And khuluq. Now he gives an example of Fadail Aman. The first one here is good manners. And the husn al khuluq, athqal ma yuda fil mizan. The heaviest thing that will be placed on your scale of good deeds after what is wajib, after being rewarded from staying away from haram, is your husn al The way you speak, the way you talk, your body language, your facial expressions, the way you treat one another. وَأَنَّ This is based on a hadith. وَأَنَّهُ يَبْلُغْ بِصَاحِبِهِ دَرَجَ الصَّائِمِ الْقَائِمِ And because of a person's good akhlaq, he will reach the level of a person who is constantly fasting and constantly praying during, during the night throughout the year. Imagine you know of a person, he never breaks his fast. There's only a few days in the year that you are not allowed to fast, the days of Eid, the days of Tashriq, etc. The days before Eid, uh, Ramadan. It's about five, six days in the year that you are not allowed to fast. Haram. But imagine for the rest of the year, that person is fasting 354 days, non-stop fasting. What would you think of this person? I'm not talking about fasting where he is just preserving himself from food and drink. I'm talking about fasting where he is preserving his actions, he's preserving his eyesight, he's preserving his tongue. You would think that this person is an amazing person. You would want to be like him. You would want to accompany him. That's just one aspect of it. This is the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the Sa'im, the person who's constantly fasting. Imagine you've got another person, he sleeps very little at night. He only sleeps as much as his body needs for him to sleep, the rest of it in Qiyam, in Ruku, in Sujood. Worshipping Allah, remembering Allah, making dua to Allah, reciting his words. What would you think about this person? You would think that this person is amazing. The way that the Quran just comes out of his mouth, the way that he's able to speak to his Lord, I wish it could be like that. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, and this is what the author is saying here, from the greatest of the fada'il a'mal, that every single one of us can do, like we said in the introduction. These actions here, you need a level of tawfiq, let's admit it. Fasting every single day would be difficult for most of us. Standing every single night will be difficult for most of us. This is who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants to. However, look at the simplicity here. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the author is reiterating here. This is an amal which is, has fadila in it that every single one of us can do and attain. He is saying here, Wa'lam rahimakullah, have firm knowledge and insight. And conviction, may Allah have mercy on you, he's making dua for us, rahimahullah, and we make dua for him. That if you correct your manners, your etiquettes, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you sit, the way you smile, the way you address one another, the way you think of one another, the way you treat one another, the goodness that you genuinely want for another person, and the harm that you genuinely feel when you hear if something bad has happened to your brother or your sister, with this, the author is saying, will be the heaviest things after what is wajib and what is staying away from haram on the scales of good deeds, Yawmul Qiyamah. 
This person will reach the level of a person who is constantly fasting by day and standing by night. And we can appreciate this because we're doing it for 29, 30 days. And it's not easy. Some people need a break in between. Some people get ill in between. Imagine there is a person doing this throughout the whole year. The author is saying here, good deed number one. Then, he gives examples from the time of the Salaf. Now this is good deed number two if you want. That a person internally, having a level of submission to Allah and khushu and submission to him subhanahu wa ta'ala, this person will be able to do many actions which are virtuous, many fada'il a'mal. The author is giving examples here through this person's level of khushu inside. And again, this is connected to the previous chapter. It requires a level of connection, requires a level of studying, aqeedah, iman, tawheed, revision. But the author is saying here, the more the person becomes humble and submits himself to his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more it will be seen in his connection with him, in his ability to worship him, and the way and the quality of worship. Then he gives an example. Uh, some of the Salaf, they used to say, Inni la'alamu hina yistajibu li rabbi azza wa jal. I know, I know when my Lord has answered my dua. I know when my Lord has answered my act of worship and accepted it. This is very important. Every single one of us pray and fast and give in sadaqah, do good deeds, and we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it. One of the salaf has said here, I know exactly how and when my deed has been accepted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِذَا وَجَلَ قَلْبِي وَشَعِرَ جَلْدِي وَفَادَتْ أَيْنَاي I know when my deed has been accepted because I can feel it in my heart. My heart trembles. When I'm doing this act of worship, I can feel it in my heart. My skin, the hairs on my skin stand up. When I'm having this level of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my eyes just become overwhelmed with tears. This is how I know that the deed has been accepted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let's not understand from here, obviously some people, it might be easier for them to cry. Some, some people, they might not have, you know, that feeling of the hair standing up on the back of their neck or on their arms, etc. That doesn't mean that your deed has not been accepted. But what he is saying here, rahimahullah, is the submission inside the humility inside. When you know that you've got that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is a sign that your deed has been accepted because this is precisely what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you. The author then goes on to say, now look at this parable, he gives us an example. And this is actually a statement of somebody that came before him from the ulama, the salaf, muwarraq al-ijli. But Ibn Qudama rahimahullah is saying it himself here, wa'alam. Imagine there is a person, he is in the water in the middle of the ocean. ocean. Imagine there is a person, he's in the middle of the water in the middle of the ocean, he's at sea. And all he has got to keep him alive is a plank of wood. That's all he's got. He looks that way, miles ahead, no land. All directions, no land. Looks up, not even a, a bird in sight. He is literally by himself at sea. The only thing that is keeping him alive is a plank of wood. This is the example that the Sheikh is giving. This person who's at sea is not in more need than you whilst you are in your home, amongst your family, with your possessions, and you think that you are in comfort. 
This is the example of every single one of us. Every single one of us, the Sheikh is saying here, is drowning at sea. And the only thing that you've got is a plank of wood to save you. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, spoke the truth. He said وسلم, that death is closer to you than the laces on your shoes. Every single one of us are in need. Every single one of us could be taken at any single moment. And then what will you have left? Only Allah. So the author is saying here, the tawakkul, the reliance, the need to do good deed. The need to do good deed. The need for khushur. The need for submission and humility that we need to instill in ourselves exists in every single one of us as if you are drowning at sea and you've only got a plank of wood to save you, to keep you alive. And he spoke the truth, Rahimullah. Because without that plank of wood, you would drown. What is that plank of wood? That plank of wood is your connection with Allah. That's how desperate you are. That's how desperate we should be. That's what our Iman should be on that level. Where you recognize that every single given moment, you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence, a dua that we have to say, your salah would not be accepted. Your Iman will not exist. I worship you alone and I need your help. I need your assistance. Every single thing. Therefore, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship Him. Show humility towards Him, the author is saying here. Don't give up. Even if you things are bad, even if you think things are bad, because of the fact that you are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you continue to ask him and he permits for you to ask him you are being listened to Allah is a sami Allah is a mujib these names and attributes exist in the Lord which are not created the way that Allah hears is a manner that befits his majesty it's not like the creation coupled with that with the fact that he is a rahman and he is a kareem and he is a hannan and he is a mannan these are names and attributes which show his generosity and his care and his love and his lutf, his latif, his al-khabir, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you supplicate to a Lord that is listening, but at the same time is generous, at the same time is merciful, at the same time is al wudud, he loves you. The Shaykh is saying here, rahimahullah, yes, you are drowning. But you are upon khair as long as you recognize you are drowning and you are supplicating to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he is listening to you. And then there are two outcomes, the author is saying here, Rahimahullah. فَإِنْ عَجَّلَ لَكَ الْإِجَابَةِ فَقَدْ جَمْعَ لَكَ بَيْنُ الْقَضَاءِ الْحَاجَةِ وَخَيْرِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers your dua, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you two things. Reward in the dunya, and a reward that He will preserve for you in the akhirah. Allah is not, subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to answer your dua and give it to you in the dunya, and not leave anything for you in the Akhirah. This is what the author is saying here. In actual fact, those people who are given in the dunya alone, it is given to them as a punishment. Do not stretch your eyes to those people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given in the dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is a fitna for them, this is a punishment for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls this al istidraj. Leave me to them. I am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, the people that have been given the dunya alone, I'm saying here. This is not for the believer, this is the point that the Shaykh is making. Those people who are given the dunya alone, the houses, the cars, the, whatever it is that you think is the dunya, the wealth, the dominion, the appearance, the strength, the status. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, He gives them more. It's what they want. He gives them. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them. And when He takes them for them in the akhirah, 
absolutely zero. And this is in a way showing you how merciful your Lord is, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gives every single person whatever it is that they want. Even the ardent kafir gets provisions from the sky. And he is allowed to live in Allah's dominion, even though this person hates Allah. Look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for the believer, the Shaykh is saying it. فَإِنْ أَجَّلَ لَكَ الْإِجَابَةَ فَقَدْ جَمَعَ لَكَ بَيْنُ الْقَضَاءُ الْحَاجَةِ وَخَيْرُ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers your dua, there are two things that are happening to you. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through his generosity and his lutf and his man and his generosity and his mercy, he has made your affairs easy in the dunya. But in the akhirah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will store something for you in the akhirah also. Hence the dua, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا Finish? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about these people, مَعَ لَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَقٍ For in the akhirah they have nothing. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ And they are from people, from mankind. May Allah make us of them the believers. يَقُولُونَ What do they say? رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا Oh Allah, help us in our affairs in the dunya. Give us goodness. وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا And this is what the shaykh is saying here. But then the shaykh is saying here, don't think for a moment that when you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you seek to get closer to him, you might not necessarily see the fruits of that. Don't think for a moment that Allah has abandoned you. وَإِن لَمْ يُجِبْ عَاجِلٌ فَقَدْ أَوَّدَكَ أَنْ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ Allahu Akbar. You make dua, any dua, oh Allah have mercy on me. The Shaykh is saying here, when you have made that dua, it has gone to a Lord who is listening, who wants you to supplicate to him, who wants to answer. Now what happens? You have done your bit. What happens now? It's gone up to Allah. The Shaykh is saying here, Rahimahullah. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer the dua immediately for you and give you good in the dunya and give you good in the akhirah. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that if he gives it to you in the dunya, it might not necessarily be the best thing for you. فَقَدْ أَوَّدَكَ أَنْ ذَلِكْ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ If your dua is not answered, you can ask for anything. And I'm sure this has happened to every single one of us here. You've made a dua and you're waiting. You made a dua and you're waiting. The Shaykh is saying here, how many times have you made dua about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? For you wanted something. You asked for something. How many times have you made dua but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you something which is far greater than your expectations? How many times have you made a dua for the dunya but Allah has given you the akhirah instead? How many times have you made dua for something in the dunya but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stored it for you, the equivalent for what you have asked for in a better place, in a better manner, with better quality. فَأَنْتَ عَلَىٰ خَيْرِ فِي الْحَالَيْنِ You are always upon good. You are a Muslim. You are precious. As long as the author is saying here, the fada'i al-a'mal comes from yourself. وَاسْتَرِحْ إِلَى مُنَاجَاتِهِ Therefore, have a relaxation and a comfort in conversing with your Lord. Be alone with Him. Speak to Him. Now here, I just want to highlight a very important point. Is that all of the ulama from the madahib, obviously there is you know, different discussion between the ulama, but the majority of the ulama, some of the Malikiyah have said that this would nullify your salah, but Hanafis, Shafis, Hanbalis, they have said if a person is in salat, especially in the night prayer, and he wants to supplicate to his Lord, but he doesn't know Arabic. There's so much I want to say to you, my Lord, but I can't say it in Arabic. There's so much I need from you, my Lord, but I don't know how to say it except in the only way that I know how to say it. Fiqhi point, can you say in your language, can you say in English, Somali, Urdu, Pushtu, whatever it might be? The majority of the ulama have said yes. 
Again, we don't want to get into this, there's not a fiqhi discussion here. Some of the Malikiyah have said it would nullify your salah, but the majority of the ulama have said you can do it even in your own language. In all prayers. In all prayers, according to the majority. Yes. In sujood, in ruku. The point here is, وَاسْتَرِحْ إِلَى مُنَاجَاتِ This is what the Shaykh is saying here. Have a portion of the day, portion of your salat. Speak to Allah. Speak to Him. Oh Allah, I've done something wrong today. Oh Allah, I've disobeyed you. I know I have. Oh Allah, I want to do better today. I wanted to do this, but I didn't get a chance. Oh Allah, help me. وَتَلَذَّذْ بِإِبَادَتِهِ And then he is saying you will taste the sweetness, the delight of worshipping him subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِنَّهُ يَرَى Oh sorry. فَإِنَّهُ يَرْوِي أَنْ أَبِي سُلَيْمَانِ الدَّرَّانِي One of the ulama from the time of the salaf. It's been narrated that this man, he came into Abu Sulaiman. So, uh, sorry, let me say this again. Abu Sulaiman al Durrani. He went to visit Ahmad ibn al Hawari. Ahmad ibn Hawari was weeping. So he says to him, Why is it that you were crying? And he goes on to talking about, and it's quite lengthy here, but I'm just going to summarize it. He goes on to talking about his weakness in front of Allah. And how he has been deficient in front of Allah. And he is talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having firm conviction and knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him. And he is talking to him. Another one, for example, here we have Mansur ibn Ammar from the time of the Salaf. He passed away 200 after Hijrah. He said, I had a man in sujood, and perhaps he's talking about himself. I had a man in sujood making this following supplication, and he is speaking and conversing with his Lord. Wa izzatik, wa jalalik, by your honor, by your splendor, ma aradtu bi ma'asiyati mukhalifatik. I did not intend to disobey you, my Lord. He's in sujood, and he is saying, My Lord. I didn't mean to do it. I genuinely did not mean to do it. وَلَا تَعَرَّدْ لِغَدَبَكْ I do not want to put myself in front of your punishment. That's not why I did it. وَلَا أَنَا بِنَكَالِكْ جَاهِلْ And I am not unaware of your punishment. You are شديد الْإِقَابْ You are قوي المتين You are absolutely the most greatest thing that exists. I'm not unaware of that. وَلَكِنْ زَيِّنَتْ لِي نَفْسِي But my soul, my desire has got the better of me. I made it fair seeming for myself to look at that thing, to listen to that thing, to eat that thing, to inhale that thing, to consume that thing, to do that thing. It kept talking to me, it kept talking to me, it kept saying to me, do it, do it, do it, so I did it. And now I am here, making sujood in front of you, my Lord. And I didn't want to do it. And I'm not unaware of your punishment. And I am not safe from your anger. And I do not think for one moment, my Lord, that I can escape your wrath. فَعَسَيْتُكْ bijahli. So I disobeyed you because of my own weakness and my own ignorance. وَخَالَفْتُكْ بِجَهْدِي And my inability to resist. This is why I did it, my Lord. فَالْآنْ مِنْ أَذَابِكْ مَنْ يُنْكِذُنِي Now, I deserve your punishment. You told me not to do it, so I did it. I tried to stop myself, but I couldn't. I was weak. Now it's only fair that you punish me. You told me not to do it. You told me from the beginning, if I was to do it, you're going to punish me. I did it anyway. I didn't listen to you. So it's fair. It's only fair. Despite the fact that all of the generosity that you have given me, the good on top of the good on top of the good, I then disobey you. It is only fair. 
إلهي مالود يوماسي is greater than my sins your mercy can extinguish my shortcomings and this is what I want and this is why I'm making sujood Sufyan rahimahullah another one from the Salaf he said man ahaqqu bi zalal wa taqseer minni wa qad khalaqtani da'ifa who is there that is slipping up more than me because I have been created weak. I am weak myself. Sufyan Athauri. Now, when we talk about the major scholars, if I ask you, can you give me a list of major scholars? You probably say Bin Baz, Uthaymeen, Albani. For the four Imams, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, Ahmed, if you were to ask them who is the major scholar of your time, they will say Sufyan Athauri. This is the level of this man. He says, Rahimahullah, Ilahi, my Lord. Man ahaqqu bi zal wa taqseer minni wa qad khalaqtani da'ifa. Excuse me. You have created me weak. And I am weak because of my own self. I have not got the ability myself to stay away from your disobedience, to stay away from something which would make the punishment eligible for me. I'm full of shortcomings, I'm full of mistakes. These are just some examples, my brothers and sisters, of how the Salaf used to converse with their Lord, and this is what the author is saying here, and this is what we need to accustom ourselves with. And we have a long hadith, and I'm going to try and go through it very quickly because it is absolutely amazing. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Talib passes away, Khadija passes away, now because Abu Talib has passed away, the people in Mecca can punish him وسلم, and the believers more because his uncle is no longer there. His uncle was a protection. He was from the heads of the Quraysh. He was a non-Muslim. He was the brother of some of these people that were punishing him. When he passes away, who is there now to protect Muhammad وسلم? No. So what he decides, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I'm going to leave Makkah and I'm going to go to Ta'if. And the reason why I'm going to Ta'if is because I have family relatives in Ta'if. And if I can go there, maybe they will be my protection now so that the Makkans can't do anything. So he goes to Ta'if. He stays there for two weeks. He is beaten, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He did this for us. He did this for the sake of Allah, of course, but he did this so that Islam would continue. He was beaten to a point where some of the narrations say that he became really lightheaded, about to faint. He's with Zayd ibn Haritha. Both of them have been beaten to the extent that bones have been broken, etc. Messenger of Allah, best of mankind, they broke his bones because he's calling us in La ilaha illallah. When he's feeling a little bit better, he stands in Qiyamul Layl and he makes this dua. Allahumma ilayka ashku da'af quwwati. Oh Allah, you have told me to convey the message to these people. I am complaining to you, O oh Allah, because of the weakness that I have in myself in the inability to convey the message. Allahu Akbar. He has done nothing wrong. This is strictly and purely the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah was testing him. And he elevated him in the test sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But look at the respect. Look at the connection. Look at the manners that he has with his Lord. Oh Allah, you sent me to these people. They beat me where I almost died. Now I complain to you because of my inability to explain to them. وَقِلَّةِ حِيلَتِهِ And my inability to think of an alternative plan so that I can make them understand maybe from a different way. I'm complaining to you, O Allah. وَهَوَانِي عَلَى النَّاسِ And my dependency upon men. I'm sorry, O Allah. اللَّهُمَّ أَنْتَ رَبُّ الْمُسْتَدْعَفِينَ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ Now here, the ulama have said, we have the adab of dua. 
if you ask Allah, it is not good etiquette from the servant to say, Oh Allah, give me. Oh Allah, give me. Give me some more. Give me. That's it. No. You begin by praising Allah. You begin by thanking Allah. You begin by counting the favours of Allah as much as you can. Oh Allah, you have done this for me, and you've done that for me, and then you have done that for me. Not only does that create more humility in yourself, but the ulama have said that this is a form of tawassul. This is important because Ahlul Sunnah believe in tawassul, but it has to be done in a manner of tawheed with dalil, not through the deceased, not through things which are inanimate. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوا بِهَا Allah has names and attributes, make tawassul through Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma anta al-musta'a, Allahumma anta rabb al-musta'a'afeen. Oh Allah, you are the Lord of those people who are being oppressed. Wa anta arhamu rahimin And you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. Wa anta rabbi, and you are my Lord. Ila man taklilani. Who are you going to entrust me in my affairs? Now, now you understand, yeah? Abu Talib has passed away. Who is going to look after me? Remember in the beginning of the dua? Oh Allah, I complain to you because of my ability, inability to explain and my connection to man. Abu Talib has passed away and I still need someone to protect me so that I can convey the message. But now he's gone and nobody's there to protect me. Except you. Anta Rabbi. Ilam anta killani. Who is going to be on top of me? Ila ba'idin yitajahimuni. Is it going to be somebody who is really far away, who is not related to me like Abu Talib was? And he is not going to treat me the same as Abu Talib used to. Abu Talib used to love the Messenger of Allah وسلم, a great deal. He found his son, Ali radiallahu an, his own son, Ali radiallahu an, praying alongside the Messenger of Allah. Abu Talib is watching them praying. Imagine he is a non Muslim. He's watching his nephew and his own son praying. This is despite the fact the Messenger of Allah has called Abu Talib to Islam over and over. He's witnessed miracles. He's witnessed trees making sujood to him. So Abu Talib is watching the Messenger of Allah and Ali radiallahu He calls his son over after the salah. And he says to Ali radiallahu quietly, follow Abu Qasim. Follow anything he tells you to do, follow him. فَإِنَّكَ عَلَىٰ دِينٍ عَلِيمٍ You are upon an amazing religion. You are upon something which is absolutely amazing. إِلَىٰ بَعِيلٍ يَتَجَهِّمُنِي Are you going to entrust me to someone who is not like how Abu Talib was with me in his respect and his love? He loved him a great deal. Oh, ila aduin malaktuhu amri. Or are you going to entrust me on top of somebody who is your enemy and my enemy, and he is going to be oppressive over me? May Allah make easy the affairs of the Muslim ummah who are being oppressed around the dunya. In lam yakum look under this. In lam yakum lika ghadamun alayya fala ubari. As long as you are not angry with me, I do not have a concern in the dunya at all. As long as you are not angry with me, my lord. Walakin afiyatak. However, your afia and your protection and your security is what I want. And it is far more greater as a covering. I seek refuge in your noble face, that which illuminates that which those people find themselves in darkness. And with this nur, with your hidayah, everything in the dunya and the akhirah becomes upright. أَنْ يَحِلَّ بِهِ سَخَتُكَ Oh Allah, I seek refuge in your face. That your anger becomes halal upon me. Who is saying this? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In sujood. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you that your anger becomes permissible upon me. O Yanzil Alayya Ghadabuk. Or that your anger and your punishment descends upon me. Laka utba hatta tamda, laka utba tamda. I return to you until you are happy. I return to you until you are happy. Wala hawla wala kuwuta illa bik. This is the dua of the Messenger of Allah. 
after they had the chance to enter into Iman, but they rejected him. The author is basically saying here, these are just some examples from the time of the Salaf, from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, himself, in your need to speak to your Lord, because every single one of us is drowning. Every single one of us is drowning. Every single one of us is getting closer towards death. And the closer you get towards death, your provisions are decreasing. Your ability to live goes down. Therefore, every single one of us is walking around Allah's dunya with a plank of wood in our hands. The author then goes on to give us another piece of advice, rahimahullah. And in this piece of advice, I'll try and summarize it, he is talking about talaba al hajja min Allah, seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّهُمْ مَنَّمْ يَسَلَ اللَّهِ يَغْدَبْ عَلَيْهِ This is a hadith which is sahih. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If a person doesn't supplicate to Allah, Allah gets angry. The author is basically saying here, ask Allah. Don't think of anything which is insignificant. We have another hadith from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he says, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if it is for the salt on your food. Even if it is for the salt on your food. The Shaykh is basically saying here, complimenting what we have just said here about conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that what he is basically saying here ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every great thing and every little thing constantly find in your day in you know your routine somehow to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he gives an example and it's quite lengthy what he is saying here about Salat al-Istikhara but Istikhara is an example Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi ilmik wa astakhiruka bi kudratik. Oh Allah, I ask you to make affairs easy for me, to help me make the right decision. And I ask you by your ability to make whatever it is that I want to do facilitated. Now, the dua for istikhara is known for us all. I don't want to go through it here because it's already been lengthier than I wanted. But the ulama have mentioned that there are four pieces of wisdom that we find in the du'a and the salat al istikhara. Number one, throughout this du'a, if you were to read it and go back through it, you will find that from the beginning of it to the end of it, the slave, the one who is supplicating to Allah, is showing desperation to Allah. Oh Allah, I am seeking your counsel. Oh Allah, I am seeking ability. Oh Allah, make it easy for me. If it is not good, turn it away from me. I need your help on this. Number two, when you are making this dua, you are asking the one, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who knows everything, and created everything, and willed everything, and recorded everything, that you ask his ability for you to make the right decision. Number three from the hikmah of Salat al-Istikhara and the Dua of Istikhara is that when the person engages in Istikhara with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it puts in this person's Iman and his soul a contentment with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed to decree after this Dua. Oh Allah help me to get this job. I really think it will be good for me. But if you think it is good for me, make it easy. If you think it is bad for me, then turn me away from it. Desperation, seeking Allah's counsel to make the right choice, and submission and contentment for whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed, which is going to happen 50,000 years before the creation of heavens and the earth. And number four, from the wisdom and the hikmah of al-istikhara, is that it creates tawakkul. Oh Allah, help me in my affairs. That's it, you've asked Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if the person has asked correctly, and if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives this person hidayah, he will instill in this person a level of tawakkul whilst other people are panicking. Why? Because this person, and this is the point that the Shaykh is making here, 
after conversing with Allah, after having that level of desperation with Allah, constantly seek help in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last paragraph, and when you do that, you will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate for you your affairs, He will help you to show contentment, it will help you to show desperation to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it will make you of those people who are reliant upon Him. The last section now, and this is how he concludes everything. Make your objective, your goal, your purpose in the life of this dunya to get close towards your Lord who is generous. And this is so true. Because he says here, what's look? فضله العظيم والاجتهاد في الدخول في أولياء الذين يحبهم ويحبونه. Your Lord سبحانه وتعالى created everything without any need for any help. He created everything without needing resources in the first place, without needing to plan, without a blueprint. He is the one سبحانه وتعالى who created everything and he is so powerful and majestic he could just say be and it becomes. And he continues to spend. And the more he spends, it doesn't decrease his richness in the first place. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he praises him as he praises himself. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The author is saying here now, when you recognize that your Lord is this generous and this powerful and this wealthy, then really your objective should be is to get close towards this Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala who created everything from nothing therefore there is not an affair in your life except that that is easier than what he has already seen you can already see that he has already accomplished subhanahu wa ta'ala there's an organ in your body that doesn't work how big is the organ? the organ probably fits in your hand is it easier for a person to get a star, which is billions of light years away, as hot as it is, to bring it up and then make it set and do it constantly, every single day, with precision, down to the second. What's easier? Something which can fit in your hand? People are doing their exams, it's a piece of paper. All you want is to see pass, or A star, or seven, or whatever it is. Is that easy or is that easier? The author is saying here, Make your objective at taqarrub ila rabbikal kareem. This Lord that has been so generous for us, and we can see his power. We can see his wealth. We can see his ability. If he is the Lord that can do that, I'm sure he can give me a piece of paper. I'm sure he can remove whatever this thing is that's causing this problem in my body, or whatever your issue might be. The author is saying here, converse with him, speak to him, but bring that all together with you becoming a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, somebody who is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very important for us to understand. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said, فَكُلُّ مَنْ كَانَ مُؤْمِنًا تَقِيًّا كَانَ لِلَّهِ وَلِيًّا Anyone who has taqwa of Allah, then that person is a wali. And again, it's important for us to highlight this because <coughs> Excuse me. Just like we said when it came to Fadail Amal, the concept of Wali of Allah uh, has some deviant ideas behind it. Some people believe that they become one with Allah, etc. Like we talked about this last time. The author, sorry, Ibn Taymiyyah is saying here anyone who has a level of taqwa with Allah, that person is a Wali of Allah. Allah, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained who the awliya are. Amanu taqwa. As long as you've got iman, and as long as you are trying to do the right thing and staying away from the wrong thing, you are a wali of Allah. That's how precious you are. That's how important you are to Allah. But Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah is saying here, undoubtedly, and this is again an issue of aqeedah when it comes to Ahmad Sunnah, that the more you increase in iman and the more you increase in taqwa, what happens? the stronger your Iman will become and then you will be lifted more closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But imagine you've got a person 
who just does his wajibat, he does what is obligatory upon him, he's got some haram also. Is he a wali still? Yes. Why? He's got belief and he's got taqwa. Enough taqwa for him to pray the five daily prayers and do what is wajib. Yes, he's got some issues in his life and his taqwa is going down, his iman is going down, he's still a wali of Allah. It's a very important concept that we have to understand. So the author is basically saying here, make your objective and your progressive in the life of this dunya to get closer as much as you can to this Lord who is extremely generous upon you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he continues to show generosity for those people who get closer to him. Do not make your concern anyone else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in dunya wala ghayruha. Either way, it's the dunya or other than the dunya. Wa'alam rahimahullah. Have firm knowledge, my brother, may Allah have mercy on you. Anna hadhi dunya sukum al abrar. This life, this dunya, is a place for competing for those people who want to attain piety. And this is the place of transition for those people. So now this life of the dunya, what he is basically saying here, this is a life of transition where you live, you walk, but then you move on to another realm, which is the akhirah, what he is saying here, and these people will be elevated because of the goodness that they had. And this is a place for you to prepare for the longest journey that you will ever embark on in your life. The journey to the Akhirah. There is no vehicle that will take you there. There is no distance that can be put on it. Nobody's ever come back and said, I travel that much time and that much distance. Your journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to go past the stars, the moon, the skies, the clouds, the sama of the dunya. The angels will take that soul and they'll continue to ascend if Allah allows it to ascend into Jannah, up and up, up, up until it gets to the Arsh of Ar-Rahman. And if it is a pious servant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اكتب له في العليين Write his name in the Illiyin. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا إِلِّيُّونَ كِتَابٌ مَرْقُومٌ يَشْهَدُونَ Ayat from Surah Mutafifin. That's where your soul is going to travel. It is the longest journey that you can ever embark on. Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, بَيْنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَالْجَنَّةِ the distance between one Jannah and another Jannah, Masir comes mi'a sana. Masir comes mi'a am, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 500 years travel between one Jannah and another Jannah. Imagine you, you have to go from here, wherever you are, the dunya, Leicester, all the way to the Arsh. This is the longest journey that you are going to ever embark on. Now, if I was to say to you, brother, let's go on a journey to another city, to another country, what would you do? What would you do? Give me some time to prepare. When do you want to go? Do you want to go tomorrow? Do you want to go next week? Let's get some fuel. Let's check the tire pressure. Let's pack. I need enough clothes. I might need some food. This is the longest journey that you are going to embark on. To the Arsh of Rahman, may Allah make us of them. Because those people who are not the people of Jannah, they will not be able to enter into Jannah. They will not be allowed. Allah says, no, write them. Write them in the Sijin and send them back down. And then that soul is thrown back into its grave. May Allah protect us. Inshallah, Allah make us of this, make us of them that their souls go up to the Arsh of Rahman. What do you need in a journey that long? Is there anything you could do to prepare? The author is saying here, Azad li safar ladi laysa kal asfar. You need azad, you need provisions, you need fuel, you need clothing, you need food, whatever provisions you need to travel. You need these provisions 
to embark on a journey that you have never embarked on in your life and you will never embark on ever again. What is it that you need? فَبَادِرْ رَحِمُكُ اللَّهِ قَبْلَ فَوَاتِ إِنْ كَانُ بِدَارْ Hasten before you lose any ability to prepare. Every single moment is leading up to that moment where the angel of death is going to pull your soul. The author is saying here you can protect yourself and prepare yourself for that journey so that when the angel of death comes, takes your soul, you've got enough. You've got enough to propel you and take you up to the Arsh of Rahman. Waqtanit and Fasik al Adima al Muqdar. Benefit from the breath, he's saying here. Every single breath is Adima. Every single breath that you have got is absolutely priceless. Rush and benefit. He's saying a lot more here, I'm going to have to summarize. But he is saying here, hasten. And you have a precedence in the salaf that came before you. They knew that one tear that leaves your eye for the sake of Allah can put out oceans of fire. This is what he is saying here, Rahimahullah. Al Qatra min Dumur min Khashyatillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala Tutfi and Bukhur min al Nar. And it's not even wajib for you to cry. Sometimes you just end up crying, you see something, you read something, it, it overwhelms you thinking about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or perhaps your weakness and it makes you cry. The author is saying here there is a salaf that has preceded you in piety, in goodness. They are an example for you. Recognize, because they did, that even one tear that leaves your eye for the fear of Allah can put out oceans of hellfire in the akhirah. One tear and put out those fires. What does he mean by that? He means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of this fada'il a'mal, because of this getting closer to him, because you became, wanted to become a wali, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will avert from you his punishment subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what was supposed to be your place in the midst of a sea of scorching fire and boiling water, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes you out from there and puts you into his rahmah. He says, Rahimahullah, every night Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends. And he says, Hal min sa'ilin fa'u'tiyana. Is there anyone that's asking so I can give to them? Hal min da'in fa'astajibun. Is there anyone that is making dua so I can give to them? Hal min mustaghfirun fa'agfirullah. Is there anyone that's making istighfar so I can give them their expiation for their mistakes. The author is basically saying here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up the opportunities for you. Do not be of those people who do not take that opportunity. Yahya ibn Mu'adh, one of the ulama of the Salaf, he passed away 250 after Hijrah. He said on the day of Eid, Ilahi, lam akun lihaqqiq ra'iyan, lam akun lidhayrik da'iyan, my Lord, I am not a person who feels that he has done enough which makes him think that the rewards are due for him. And at the same time, I have no one else to ask and to worship and to get close to except you. He's saying this on the day of Eid after a month of fasting, after a month of standing, after a month of making dua, after 10 days of maybe itikaf and Allah may nika afu tahibul, he is saying, I don't think I've done enough. But at the same time, I don't have anyone else to turn to. Ilahi, my Lord. Lam akun ila khayarat nusari'an. Lam akun nibabi. Lam akun nilbab albayi qari'an. 
Oh Allah, I have not hastened to do good deeds in a manner that I feel that I should have. I haven't reached my full potential. This is Yahya bin Mu'adh, one of the ulama of the Salaf. And I don't think I've knocked on your door enough. Ilahi amali kasrab. My actions, I know, are like a mirage. I do some good deeds here and there, but really, it's, it's nothing. وَقَلْبِي مِنْ تَقْوَى خراب. And my heart is supposed to have taqwa, but really my heart is corrupt, it's just full of filth. وَذُنُوبِي أَكْثَمْ مِنْ تراب. And my sins are more than the grains of sand in the desert. وَأَنْتَ أَوْلَى بِالْأَفْوَ وَالصَّفْحِ But you are the very first and the very greatest of those who show pardon and leniency. فَاغْفِرْ لَنَا وَرْحَمْنَا بِجُودِكَ وَطُولِكَ إِيَا ذَا الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ So have mercy on us through your mercy, or sorry, forgive us through your mercy and your generosity. This is just another example of how to get closer to Allah and how to speak to Him and wanting to become a wali. He says in the end, Rahimahullah, this is what he had to say. And remember, he was asked if he can give advice. And this is the advice that what he is concluding with. And he is saying, this is what I had to say. And I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who is unique and he has no partner. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or anyone that can resemble him. That he overlooks for us our mistakes and our self-oppressions. And that he doesn't punish us with the justice that he will punish people with but rather we are seeking his mercy we are seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he doesn't hold us to account yawm al qiyamah with justice if he holds us according to his justice we're all doomed but if he holds us to account with his mercy there is hope and it is through this that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said people will enter into Firdaus it is through this that people will enter into Jannah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been merciful towards them because they don't deserve it. Wala anta ya Rasulullah, even me. Unless if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy upon me. This is the reward. Can you imagine the reward then? Can you imagine how amazing Jannah must be? That no matter what you do from 0 to 60, 70, 80, 90 years of your life, you will not do enough to enter into Firdaus. How amazing must that Firdaus be? As some of the ulama have said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ أَرْضُهَا أَرْضِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Hasten to enter into a Jannah which is wider than all of the creation. Wider than all of the creation. How small are you? How bad must it be for a person and how far must he be away from Allah if he can't find himself to enter into something which is so vast you can understand if the door is narrow I can't get through but the doors for Allah's Jannah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said just one door 40 years in travel and there are multiple doors and we did traveling before when the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa says this so 40 kilometers an hour times that by 24, times that by 360. Now here we've got 40 years, times that by 40. What's your equation? What's the solution? What's the answer? I don't think we're supposed to know the answer. When you've got a door that wide and nobody can't enter, you can't enter it. Wallahi ladeem, the problem is not with Allah. Subhan Quddus, he is perfect, he is pure, he is holy. The problem, as the author is saying here, Rahimahullah, is that we haven't spoken to him. We haven't asked him. And we have failed to become from the awliya of Allah. We haven't done enough. And you can only blame yourself. May Allah protect us from this. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes this wasiyah as a means of him attaining Jannah, Rahimahullah. Just like he advised us about the akhirah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he elevates his status in the Akhirah. Likewise, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us of those who hear and follow what they have heard in the best of man. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He grants us firdos and the highest level of firdos and the actions of the people of firdos and that He protects us from the hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's refuge from just seeing His punishment and His anger. We ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pardon and His security for us and our loved ones. Hada, wallahu a'lam. Sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.